Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us, please? Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us, please? Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 holy. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Holy eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you.
Jesus, I surrender all to Him. I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily. Live. I surrender. surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, Jagger. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good to have the women back from the women's retreat last week. I do need to make a note on that real quick. There was a lost and found that's right outside there on the table. I guess there's a missing shoes. So if you're missing your shoes today, it might be over there in the might, lobby. Might be mine. That might be. be. <laughs> so uh, just a couple of things out there. So be sure to check that if you went to the women's retreat to make sure you're not missing anything. We got a lot of announcements today. So if you have your bulletin today, you'll look in there and see that we have an Iwana Club store donation list that's in there. Now, Right across from the library door, we have a table set out for donations. These are donations for kids 5 to 11 for Awana every Tuesday. Uh, the kids earn little bucks for uh, memorizing verses or, or, or showing up on time or, or doing things like that. And then they can go and spend their bucks on things like erasers or, or bouncy balls or, or things you see on here. And so if you have anything extra, if you want to go buy something uh, feel free to just go put it onto that table. We also accept checks and cash, and we'll have a little bin for that next week. So we'll have that table out there all throughout the week. If you didn't bring anything today, no worries. We'll have that next time as well. We also have on your list the men's breakfast Sunday, October 14th. So we have a sign-up sheet right out there for the men's breakfast from 8.30 to 10 a.m. Uh, I think, it, oh, Saturday, I'm sorry, thank you. Good correction. That'd be bad if everyone showed up Sunday morning for breakfast. No, Saturday. <laughs> Sunday. No breakfast, though, Sunday morning. No breakfast Sunday morning. No, Saturday, October 14th. Uh, I think it's the, the eclipse, October 14th as well. Yep, Chuck made note of that. So uh, an extra benefit for the guys' men's breakfast. So we look forward to that. We also have a youth activity October 15th. That's going to be mini golf. That was supposed to be last week. Didn't end up working out. I had some wisdom teeth taken out was not very fun. But October 15th, right after church, we're going to supply lunch to any of the youth that want to go, and we're also going to supply mini golf. So just write your name on the sign-up sheet out there. If you have any youth, bring your friends as well. We'll have a great time doing that. October 19th through the 20th, we have the Grand Parenting Seminar. Uh, Pastor Doug will be heading that up. So if you have any questions on that, please see him. October 20th, we have our family fun night at NBC. So that's from 7 to 9 p.m. There will be games, activities, uh, lunches, things like that. So please look forward to that. And then the day right after that, October 21st, we have a church work day. That's from 8 a.m. to 12 o'clock. We're going to be painting some of the uh, rooms over there. We're going to be doing some other special projects. So if you would like to come to that and help us out, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, finally, October 28th, we have the trunk and treat. So we now finally have these cards out here to pass these out to people around. Um, there's a handful of them right outside, and then next week we're going to use the tracks that the youth made a couple of weeks ago. We'll put those on the chairs here along with this. It'd be a great way for you to pass it out to people around, maybe a neighbor, maybe when you go to the grocery store. Just spread the word out about the trunk or treat. Um, it's not only a good time of fellowship, but it's also to get the word out and to let people know about Mid-Valley Bible Church, but more importantly, let them know about the gospel. And so we really look forward to the Trunk or Treat event. We have a meeting right after church today if you're interested in helping. Uh, we really could use a lot of volunteers. We have a lot of plans for Trunk or Treat. Um, but if you're not able to, I, I ask that you pray for helpers in that field. Uh, we definitely could use the help uh, for anybody who's willing to uh, have a couple of hours to either pass out some candy or help with games, things like that. So I think that's all for announcements that we have today. You can pick these up right outside there as well. Again, next week you'll see them on your chairs. You'll also see these on your chairs. Don't eat the candy. These are for people to pass out. These are the tracks, okay? Let's go to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so grateful to gather together and have this freedom here uh, in the United States to do so. We're thankful that we have your full word. God, we're thankful that you continue to use it 
and to pierce our hearts and to reveal yourself to us. And, and God, just give us understanding today as Pastor Doug preaches from your word. May it just be from your word. May it be what you have him to say and, and, and something, Lord, that will uh, help us hold you to the highest honor and to spread your word and to really share about your grace to a world who has rejected it. Um, God, but we know that you're at work in our friends and family's lives, and we're so thankful for that, and we trust you each and every day with, with their souls. Uh, but we just pray that uh, they would come to know you, God, and uh, we, we thank you for opening up our eyes and uh, for having us here at Mid Valley to fellowship. We pray for the other churches as well who are giving sermons today. Lord, may the whole body just be encouraged in the midst of a lot of turmoil with Israel. I just pray that you give Tim the words to say today and protect those who are in Israel. Lord, our hearts are heavy for them. But we're just thankful, God, that uh, you do have a plan for Israel. And uh, God, we, we know who wins at the end of all of this, and we're thankful for it. We say these things in Jesus' name, amen. And if you're good, if you're able, would you stand with us, please? Years I spent in vanity and pride, carried not my Lord was crucified. No, not it was for me, he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul come liberty. Now I give to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was not applied to me. Every burden soul found liberty at Calvary. The love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Forgiven because you were forsaken. 
time accepted you work and dead I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you might love I know it's true it's my joy to honor you amazing love how can it be that you my king would die for me amazing love
may be seated. If you have a Bible, I would invite you at this time to open it to the book of Ecclesiastes. And what I want to do this morning in our third message from this Old Testament book, this journal of King Solomon, is I want to read the first 17 verses of Ecclesiastes 2. Now, before I do that, I do want to mention something. I have a very, very good friend. His name's Will Gunnels. Uh, Will played football for LSU. He went to seminary in Portland, and he was a regional director with the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. A number of years ago, he came to Utah and came to actually snow ski, stayed with us for a couple of days, and during the course of our visit with him, I gave him a mug from Mid Valley Bible Church. And you know what Will does every single Sunday? He drinks his coffee from his Mid Valley Bible Church mug. What's more, one of the things that we had talked about is we wanted to have something that we could give to our guests who come to Mid Valley Bible Church, something tangible, something that they could take home with them. And so what we decided to do, because this also happened to be our 70th anniversary as a church, we've made up some mugs. Now, these mugs are today only going to be given. No, we'll give it to anybody else who comes. But if you are a regular attender of this church, if you drink coffee, if you want a mug, guess what? They are readily available at the Information Center, and we have blue mugs, red mugs, black mugs, and green mugs. So you can take your pick. So if you are an adult, if you drink coffee, take a mug home with you. Next week, we'll make them available as well, and then we're going to be having a, a pin put in it, we're going to have some candy in it, some information about our church, and so when guests come, they're going to be able to take home a Mid-Valley Bible Church mug. And if you know somebody who will drink their coffee on Sunday morning out of this mug and pray, pray for Mid-Valley Bible Church, you pick up a mug and give it to them. I think this will be a wise investment. Tim, did you see these? They're very nice. They're very nice. Lovely. And I want to thank Jesse Delgado and Carol Culberson and my lovely wife, Connie, for taking care of that item for us. So thank you. Well, I want to read, as I said, the first 17 verses from Ecclesiastes 2. And in honor of the Word of God, if you are able, would you please stand? Ecclesiastes 2 beginning with verse 1. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Solomon writes, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of pleasure. Well, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guided me with wisdom. And how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under the sun during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines to the delight of the sons of man. Missing a page, so let me go to this. Verse 9, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. And I considered that my hands had done and the toil I had expected in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. What can the man do who comes after the king? 
only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring in remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and striving after wind. Beloved, this is God's instructive and helpful word to us. May our hearts be open to what he wants to teach us. You may be seated. I'm sure if you're like me, you awoke yesterday morning to the news that Israel was under attack. We believe very strongly in the nation of Israel. We love the Jewish people because we know that God has a purpose for them. And because Tim Valesco has a number of connections in Israel with friends, and we have a missionary over there, that uh, Tim knows quite well and has been in contact with. I asked him if he would to just take a moment this morning and give us an update on how we can best pray in that situation. Tim, God bless you as you share. Thank you. So uh, this will be about 30 minutes or so. Just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So I have some prepared remarks here, but I'm going to first just speak from my heart. And I think that's important because uh, when we... Uh, if you read the news, and you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure you've seen images and you've seen things on the news in the last 36 hours or so. They're just horrible and heartbreaking to see. And uh, what I'm going to ask you to do is just for a moment, don't try to understand. Just take a break. Do yourself a favor. Don't watch CNN or Fox News today. Just take a break and do this instead. Pray. And don't make complicated prayers, giving God instructions on how to take care of world affairs. Just do really simple things. Say, God, what do you want to be done in the life of Jewish people, in the nation of Israel, and in my own life? And then wait. Um, I want to read this to you from the New Living Translation. It's from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 and 36. And it says this, In the Lord, it is the Lord who provides the sun to light the day and the moon and stars to light the night, and who steers the sea into warring waves. His name is the Lord of heaven's armies. And this is what he says. And I love the way he puts this because it's so simple. I'm as likely to reject the people of Israel as I am to abolish the laws of the nation. Now, I really deeply desire that my friends in Israel that don't have the peace that I have because of my faith in Messiah Yeshua, Messiah Jesus, would truly know that. I have been, I'm tired this morning because I've been in contact with people there, both believers and those that are not believers yet, I'd like to say. And it is just an awful, awful situation. In my uh, most worst dreams, I could not imagine what's going on there. This is Yom Kippur war. Uh, this is much worse. Uh, and that came in with some, and mine as well. Because at then, it was armies. And you can fight armies. These are not armies. These are, are, are men who crossed the border of Gaza. Uh, and uh, we can talk a little bit about how that happened, but I'm not going to do that today. And they went in and systematically murdered men, women, children, while yelling, Allah Akbar, which means Allah is greatest. And as somebody put it this morning, this is not a war to uh, establish a Palestinian state. And I know this is going out on YouTube and I'm not a fan. This is a war to establish a Muslim Palestine. And what that means is if that comes to pass now, we are no longer citizens, and they are no longer citizens. And what I want to do is this, just to give you a quick update. Up to 500 people killed so far, and it's likely from the people that I spoke with that there's going to be many more, many more, because unfortunately, there are still some villages that are still, um, uh, there's still gunfights going on, and we don't know what's, what's happened there. There are thousands have been injured. In fact, our, the Granovskis, are, are, uh, the family that we support in Israel, have two sons 
that are married to two uh, girls of the same name, and they're both expecting a child at any moment, and there is no hospital for them to be delivered because it's full of people that are waiting. So would you pray for that? Pray for Sasha. Pray for Lillian. Pray for Ariel, who's been called up in the Army, who's in a special unit, that I wouldn't be surprised if she's in action right now for the people that we support as a church. I want to pray for Yonatan as well and make sure that uh, God protects him as he gets called up. Everybody that has a male uh, in their family that is military age has been called up. It has to be a concern. Now, what we have is a long and hard and difficult road ahead because there's over 100 people or more we don't know yet that are um, held hostage in Gaza now. And it seems that many of them, if not a few of them, are U.S. citizens. So these are Israeli American citizens that are now in the land of Hamas. So we would be praying for that. But I want to just read this because I don't want to lose track of time and of what I want to communicate today to you. In times like this, it's important for us for not to lose hope and not to be snatched up into theories and conjectures about the future, but instead to pray. And I want us to pray like the psalmist prays in, in Psalm 83, that soft prayer. And I'm going to just read some portions of that psalm for us as a prayer to God. It says, O oh God, do not be silent. Do not be deaf. Do not be quiet, O oh God. Don't you hear the uproar of your enemies? Don't you see that your arrogant enemies are rising up? They devise crafty schemes. They are, they're crafty. Against your people, they conspire against your precious ones. Come, they say, let us wipe out Israel as a nation. We will destroy the very memory of its existence. I want to skip to verse 13. It says, oh, my God. Scatter them like tumbleweed. And we've seen that happen here in the West, right? Like chaff before the wind. I'm going to pause here for a minute. We are called to a greater, by, by our Messiah, to pray and to love our enemies. How do we do that, right? I don't know. But I have the Holy Spirit to guide me and his word to instruct me, right? So Psalm 83, verse 16 says this. And this is the psalmist still praying. Utterly disgrace them until they submit to your name, O Lord. So what I want us to do this morning is we're going to pray for the Jewish people. We're going to pray for our family, the Gronovskis. But we're also going to pray for the salvation of those that are doing harm. I don't want to, but we will. <laughs> Let's do that together. Father, we come before you this morning. And we know that you're the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I know that Jacob and his family went into Egypt and came out a nation, and there's no nation in the world that has the promises that the nation of Israel has. We recognize, Lord, that the nation of Israel as it exists today is one that has been ingathered for judgment. We, we know that this is a difficult reality to understand, especially as we have our friends, those that are dear to us, in harm's way. Lord, we want to pray for your protection, protection over many names, people that I can list by name now that are in active service. Pray that you watch over them, that you be the shield, the magen, and that you guide them and protect them. Lord, I pray that the stratagems of the enemy will be thwarted. I pray for those that right now as we speak languish in a dungeon somewhere, and are wondering how long, if ever, they will be rescued, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that they will be rescued. I pray that you give wisdom to the leadership in Israel, who is extremely divided, Lord, just like we are here, maybe perhaps more so. And you guide them in their decisions, Lord. Lord, I don't want to spend too many words telling you your business, for this is your people and your business. But I ask, Lord, protect them. Father, I pray that those that are doing harm and have done harm on the enemy's side, we are called to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, Lord. So we do that right now, and we ask that hearts will be transformed. We also know, Lord, that there are believers in you who live in the Gaza right now. And we pray, Lord, that you will protect them and that your hand be upon them. Lord, comfort our hearts as we mourn with those who mourn, and let us in the future rejoice and to look and see what you have done. Protect us in our minds, Lord, that we won't be guided by weird theories and start looking into things that are not 
get into it as we know that your truth and your prophecy, Lord, when it happens, that we have never any doubt that it came to pass. And we pray these things in the name of Messiah Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Amen. At this time, we will be dismissing our children to kick, kick, kids in the church.
Malcolm Muggeridge was a popular agnostic journalist and TV personality who lived in England until his death in 1990. He was a highly respected author. He appeared regularly on the BBC. And I suppose a good companion, if you want a parallel to be drawn, would be he was sort of the Walter Cronkite of England. Muggeridge, by the grace of God, laid in his life through the influence of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, came to faith in Christ. And in 1969, he wrote a book about his conversion to Christianity entitled simply, Jesus Rediscovered. And in that book, he writes the following. I may, I suppose, regard myself or pass for being a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can fairly easily earn enough to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the internal revenue. That, he says, is success. Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may partake of trendy diversions. He says that's pleasure. He goes on and he writes, it might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated for me to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet, he writes, I say to you and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by a million. Add them all together. And they are nothing, less than nothing, a positive impediment measured against one drought of that living water Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. Do you see what Muggeridge is saying? He's saying, I've achieved what most people in life are looking for. I've experienced fame. I've experienced success, so much so that I have money to do pretty much whatever I want to do. What's more, my opinion is sought after. When, when I talk, people listen. He says that brings a degree of fulfillment. And yet he says, with all of those things on my resume, my life came up short. My life was nothing compared to that of knowing God. He says, those things didn't satisfy, they failed to meet my need. And it wasn't until I met God in the person of Jesus Christ that my life took on significance. And because experience is the best teacher, it required Muggeridge to learn that firsthand. But you know what, if he had been listening to the wisdom of Solomon as recorded for us in his journal in the Old Testament book called Ecclesiastes, Muggeridge and us would save ourselves a boatload of heartache. He would tell us, you know, I wish I had listened to the wisdom of Solomon as recorded in the book called The Preacher because that's what Ecclesiastes means. And what you and I are doing on Sunday mornings is we're looking at this three thousand is that I didn't get to this book sooner. You know, you would think after almost 50 years of preaching, I would have gone through the book of Ecclesiastes. But you know what? I avoided it. I avoided it out of fear that I didn't fully understand it. But you know what? As I've gotten older... I can readily identify with everything that Solomon is saying. You know, what's interesting is that a great subtitle that fits this book is simply The Hollow House of Hedonism. And what you find Pastor Solomon doing is taking us in this book from room to room, a room that's filled with wine, a room that's filled with women, a room that's filled with wisdom, a room that's filled with gardens and golds and songs and servants. And he says, as I go from room to room in this hollow house of hedonism, 
I'm finding that every room, no matter what it's filled with, doesn't satisfy my deepest need. Now, just to remind you, I suggested that the book of Ecclesiastes, in a very real sense, is simply the the personal journal of Solomon, who was the wisest man who ever lived. But what happened, and it happens to us all, is he got off track. Three weeks ago, we looked at the end of chapter 1 where Solomon tried to think his way to an answer using his mind apart from God to figure out the mysteries of, of this existence called life. And what Solomon says in the latter half of Ecclesiastes 1 is that his quest for knowledge through human intellect ended in exasperation and frustration and sorrow. He says it's all vanity. And so what Solomon does in chapter 2 is he takes another approach. And he starts talking to himself. He starts talking about getting more out of life. And he says to himself, he says, come now. Let's see, there we go. He says, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. Interesting Hebrew word, by the way, that word test. It indicates what follows is an experiment. It was a deliberate attempt on the part of Solomon to test something from personal experience. You know, it's been said that experience is the best teacher. And some people just need to learn those lessons on their own. And that was the case of Solomon. Solomon wasn't going to listen to somebody else, tell him that these things won't give you happiness. Solomon wanted to try these things out for himself. That word pleasure shows what he wants to experience. What Solomon is after is the good life. He's sort of like the wanderer in the song Bono of U2 fame wrote for Johnny Cash. When Johnny Cass said, I went out there in search of experience to taste and to touch and to feel as much as a man can before he repents. By the way, did you notice as I read the scripture this morning how often Solomon in these 17 verses uses the first person pronoun I? If I counted correctly and I counted twice, In my translation, he uses the word I 25 times. What's more, you have the pronoun me, my, and myself used 21 times. And what Solomon is doing is in this autobiographical section is he's talking about his own personal experiences. And he does this for a reason. He wants to emphasize the self-indulgent pursuit of self-centered pleasure. Solomon is an experimental hedonist. And what he does is he takes the the first answer in the Westminster Shorter Catechism that reads, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is the chief end of man is to enjoy God and to glorify God rather and enjoy Him forever. And what Solomon does is he takes that truth and he turns it on his head. And he says the man's chief end is to glorify himself and enjoy himself as much as he can. And that's what Solomon is doing in these verses. And you know what? If we're honest with ourselves this morning, that's a temptation that we all have, is it not? We all want to please ourselves rather than God. Good question to ask yourself is what pleasures... Am I tempted to take for myself instead of seeking the pleasures of God? And what Solomon does is in this journal, which I believe was written towards the end of his life, is he's going to say, you know, when it comes to living, I've tried it all. And all of the things that this world has to offer came up short. And Solomon gives his... Well, he gives his findings right out of the gate. gate. What he says is, I said in my heart, come now and I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But he says, guess what? 
All of those pleasures that I was pursuing came up short. In other words, pleasure did not satisfy his soul any more than the wisdom that he talked about at the end of chapter 1. Pleasure, like a lot of things, seems to hold out the promise of purpose and meaning for living. And yet Solomon says in the end, it just vanishes. It's nothing. It's emptiness. It's like a puff of smoke that's here one moment and gone the next. And then what happens is that Solomon, to make sure people knew that he gave hedonism a fair shake, he mentions in verses 2 through 8 all of the pleasures that he tried. And then in verses 9 to 11, he has a personal reflection on what he learned from his experience. And he says, the first thing I did is I experimented with comedy. I said, of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? You know, some people try to deal with their insecurities by always joking around. They're never serious. They don't have a serious bone in their body. Life is a joke. When they get down on themselves, they make fun of other people, revealing their insecurities. When they're bored, they go to YouTube or Comedy Central to get a giggle, anything for a laugh. And Solomon says, I tried this sort of thing too, and yet it failed to bring me lasting fulfillment. Interesting, that word, it is mad. See that word mad? It's a Hebrew word that indicates moral perversity rather than mental oddity. Now some things are funny, and some things are perverse. And you know what Solomon is saying here? I went outside the boundaries of good, clean humor. Listen, nobody loves a joke more than me. And I don't mind a joke being played on me. In fact, I always appreciate it because then I know you love me. But you know what Solomon's saying here? There's a kind of joyful laughter that brings glory to God. And there's also kind of laughter and joy that some people seem to have, that's dishonoring to him. Friend, God's not a killjoy, nothing wrong with humor, providing it doesn't come at someone else's expense, or that humor is crass and vulgar and improper or cynical. And what Solomon is saying here is because life is hardly a laughing matter, he says, I went out and I, 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 I tried to find pleasure in comedy, and it came up short. Again, there are some things that you ought never laugh about. I think the funeral of someone who dies without Jesus Christ is one of those. And Solomon, after talking about comedy, moves to the next pleasure that he tried. And that is he tried alcohol which is another popular way people back then and even today try to find fulfillment and joy in. They use it as a a means of escape from life's troubles. And Solomon says, I tried to cheer my body with wine. You know, a couple of things that are worth noting, and that is Solomon, like many people today, was evidently abusing alcohol. He was, he was getting drunk, something that the Bible clearly forbids. But isn't it interesting that he says, all the while I was doing that, he said, my heart still was guided with wisdom. And the reason we know that is because Solomon wrote in Proverbs 20, verse 1, that wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler. And whoever is led astray by it is not wise. And whether Solomon drank in moderation or whether he was a full-blown alcoholic, we can't say for sure. But either way, he says, my wine drinking was marked by, well, by apparently an effort to pursue it as a means of escape. It's interesting that at the end of verse 3, he introduces a a very prominent theme that you find throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, 
namely the brevity of life. And what Solomon is saying there is we, because life is short, we need to pursue pleasure while we can. That's what he was thinking at least. He, we, we need to eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. And I suspect that that sentiment was never expressed more clearly than remember the, the beer ad that occurred in the 60s and 70s? You only go around once in life, go for all the gusto you can get. And that's what Solomon was doing. And yet he says in the pursuit of that, he said, life came up empty. And a lot of pleasures in life to pursue. And Solomon tried all of them. We're going to see that throughout this book. But you know what? Every single one of them, apart from God, came up empty. He goes on in verses 4 through 6, and he says that he built beautiful homes where he planted magnificent gardens, but that did not satisfy. He said, I made great works. I built houses and vineyards for myself, gardens, parks. I planted all kinds of trees. I made pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Solomon was an architect, a builder, and a developer. We know from 1 Kings that it took him over a decade to build his, talent, his palace. And it only took him seven years to build the temple. Which ought to give you an idea of where his priorities were. He had gardens with fruits and vegetables and vineyards. And by the way, did you notice that all of the things that he built easily overlooked. Every single one of them is in the plural. It's not that he built a house, a vineyard, garden, park, and pool. He built houses and vineyards and gardens and parks and pools. Friend, this was a guy who had a ski chateau in Deer Valley, a beach house in the Bahamas, a penthouse in Paris. His homes were on the cover of Architects Digest along with a photo spread in Better Homes and Garden. This was a guy who had it all. And given the vast scope of his building project and the huge size of his property, Solomon need a vast, massive workforce to simply maintain it. And, and so we're told in verse 7 that he had male and female slaves, some that he bought, some that were born into his household. He had possessions of herds and flocks more than any who had been before him in Jerusalem. I'm not going to take the time to turn, but if you're taking notes, just jot in your notes 1 Kings 10. There you read about the Queen of Sheba coming to visit Solomon, and she was absolutely blown away at the palace that he was living in, and the number of servants waiting on him hand and foot. What's more, 1 Kings 4.23 talks about the amount of food that it took just to feed his servants for one day. And this is what the chef in the palace of Solomon had to prepare daily. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, so you know I'm not lying... 1 Kings 4.23, it says that the chefs in Solomon's palace needed daily 185 bushels of fine flour, 375 bushels of meal, 10 grain-fed cattle, 20 range cattle, 100 sheep, and miscellaneous deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowls. Friend, that's what it took to feed the people that were working for Solomon. And to keep an operation like that going, it takes not only a lot of food, it takes a lot of money. And so it says that Solomon in verse 8 gathered for himself silver and gold and treasures of kings and provinces. And this was a man who through taxing his people as well as getting money from people who came to visit him, had more money than he could possibly spend. Again, when you read 1 Kings 10, and I challenge you to do so, it says that Solomon's palace was full of gold shields, 
His drinking vessels were made of gold. He had an ivory throne that was overlaid with gold. Everywhere you turned in the palace of Solomon, there was gold. And what's more, he used that money to make beautiful music. He says, I had singers, both men and women. Music was a a rare pleasure in those days. And Solomon could afford to bring into his home the very best. Notice that he mentions that it's both men and women. Choirs back then, for the most part, were made up of men. Sorry, ladies, you'd have to sing at home in the showers. It was mostly men. But you know what? Solomon here says, I had both. It wasn't just buildings and vineyards, gardens, pools, and fools, and food and music that was at Solomon's beck and calls. We're also told that he had concubines. He said he had many concubines that brought about delight for the Son of Man. Now, friend, I want to be ever so sensitive on this topic. But evidently, Solomon experienced sex quite frequently with no less than 1,000 different women. Friend, it pains me to say that. But according to 1 Kings 11, Solomon had 1,000 sexual partners in his royal harem. And again, if you're taking notes, you can just read from 1 Kings 11. It says that King Solomon loved many foreign women, and he clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princes and 300 concubines, and what happened is these women turned his heart away from God. In fact, drop down to verse 10, okay? It says, whatever his eyes desires, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Whatever Solomon saw, he took, if he wanted it. Whenever he was tempted to indulge in a fleshly pleasure, he gave in. He denied himself nothing. He was a man who had wine, women, and song his all day long. He was a man whose face would have been on the cover of Fortune and People magazine. His home would have been a feature spread in architectural design. Elton John, Taylor Swift, Bruce Springsteen, Pavarotti, Josh Groban would have sang at his birthday parties. What's more, Solomon says here that supermodels would flirt for his affection. And this guy seemingly had it all. And let's be honest, okay? It's hard when you read this not to sort of envy this man. I mean, if you could get away with it, you just might be tempted to live the lifestyle that Solomon did. But friend, before you say yes to that experiment, you need to know what happens to people who pursue that kind of a lifestyle, where they make passion and pleasure their primary pursuits. And you know the answer to that already, don't you? The reason I say that is because we have as many opportunities as Solomon had, if not more. Friend, we have today as many opportunities to indulge the flesh and our selfish desires as Solomon had, if not more so. I don't think it's a stretch to say that generally speaking, we live in better homes with better furniture than Solomon had. I mean, think about it. We have air conditioning in the summer and heat in the winter. We keep our homes at a comfortable 72 72 degrees year-round. This morning when I got up at 4.30, the house was a little on the chilly side. So I went to the thermostat. And you know what? With two touches of the finger, I warmed up the house. Hot and cold running water, indoor plumbing, 
We're able to take baths or showers with the flip of a switch. We can have lights on. We can have the TV, internet. We can eat more and better food than Solomon had. Can you imagine Solomon going to Golden Corral or Chuckarama? We're able to listen to a wider variety of music and do so instantly. We're able to take out horseless chariots and drive wherever we want if we can afford the gas. And it pains me to say this, but as far as sex is concerned, people today can download an endless parade of virtual partners, a harem for the imagination, as everything is offered to us with the click of a mouse. And if you want flesh and bone on that imagery, it's also readily available. So let me ask, are people today satisfied or do they want more? For most Americans today are experiencing more pleasure than most people in the history of the world. And yet in spite of our prosperity and pleasure, or perhaps because of it, we still suffer from a poverty of soul as people desperately search for meaning in life. And so Solomon says in verse 9, he says, I, I became great, I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem, and my wisdom remained with me. And yet, on the morning after, pursuing all these pleasures, see what he says in verse 11. He says, Then I considered all that my hands had done, all the pleasures that I had enjoyed, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. You see that word, consider? It's an interesting Hebrew word. Literally, it means to face, to look something right squarely in the eye. And Solomon is saying here, I'm facing up to reality. I'm looking at life the way it really is, and it's not a pretty picture. Solomon says, I squeezed all the pleasure I could out of life, and still there is nothing to be gained from living under the sun. Friend, if you want the big idea of this morning's message, let me give it to you right here. Pleasure pursued for its own sake cannot satisfy our souls. That's what Solomon is saying here. That's what I want to communicate to you this morning. And it's a lesson we need to learn from Ecclesiastes or else we'll learn it from our own melancholy experiences. And what he does in verses 12 through 17 is he says, it doesn't matter whether you're smart or dumb, whether you live your life with wisdom or folly, whether you live it in light or the dark, they both end up being forgotten. And so he says in the end, he says, I hated life. Friend, I I, I couldn't stand what I was going through because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and striving after the wind. Friend, that's what this whole section is about. You know, Tom Brady is considered by most the greatest quarterback to have ever played professional football. In his 20 years of playing professional football, he won seven Super Bowls with two different teams, six with the New England Patriots and one with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. A number of years back, he was interviewed on 60 Minutes. And I want you to listen to what Tom Brady said. He said, why do I have these Super Bowl rings? And still think there's something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey man, this is what is. I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me? I think it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't. This can't be what it's all cracked up to be. And after Tom Brady made that statement... 
The interviewer asked, what's the answer then? And Tom Brady said, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Think about Tom Brady for a moment. He's got more money than he could possibly spend. He has more Super Bowl rings and more MVP titles than probably anybody will ever have. And yet, he, as he was out there looking for fulfillment, he didn't find it. He was married to a beautiful, beautiful supermodel who, if you know about his life, she left him last year, in part because he was a selfish man. Life was all about Tom Brady. Friend, you want to know why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible? You want to know why God put this inspired journal of Solomon in Holy Scripture? It's to convince us that satisfaction only comes in God Himself and that this world is not enough. And friend, if you're not convinced of that yet, go to the back of the book and read chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. Because this book is not designed to discourage or depress us. It's a book that's designed to drive us back to God. To remind us that we've been made for another world. That there's a God in heaven who sent His Son to save us and then satisfy us. And God offers to us in the person of Jesus Christ total satisfaction in the crucified and risen Christ. And you know what? When we come to Him, we can enjoy life. We can receive laughter as a gift from Him where we don't mock other people and joke in a vulgar way. Where we can taste true pleasure when we receive wine as a gift from God and not make a mockery of ourselves by getting intoxicated. We're able to taste God's pleasure when we design good homes and buildings to minister and to encourage other people and built for the glory of God, not for our own grandeur. We're able to taste God's pleasure when we stroll through a beautiful garden and feast our eyes on the color of creation and we see the beauty of God. Friend, we see pleasure in music that delights the ear and moves our emotions to worship God. And there's pleasure in sexual relations when it's shared as the designer intended. Sexual intimacy that is given exclusively between one man and a woman in a covenantal relationship of marriage. Friend, can I remind you this morning that God is not a spoil sport? God's not trying to take pleasures away from us. He's trying to give us more. And once you and I learn that we find our satisfaction in God Himself and then His gifts, those gifts take on the the greatest of pleasures and delight. You know, I think it's safe to say that this morning's conclusion is summed up in the words of the hymn written by Aria Miller and made famous by gospel singer George Beverly Shea, who said this, I, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I, I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hands than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that this journal that was kept so transparently by Solomon, a man who 
totally got off the rails and trying to find happiness and joy and satisfaction in the things of this world. And at the end of his book, came to his senses. I pray that we would not have to go through all of the heartache that Solomon did before we come to that reality. Help us to realize that in Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, there is, there is fulfillment. Help us to be Christian hedonists who take our pleasure in God and not in the things of this world. Because the things of this world are vanity, they're empty, they're meaningless, and they're purposeless. And the good gifts that you give us, the gifts of, of comedy and food and building, and sex, and all of the delights that are ours, help us to find them within the framework of God's design and God's purpose. Seal these truths, we pray, to our heart, for we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people agreed and said, amen. Let's stand and we'll sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning I've been talking this morning primarily to people who are here and know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And this morning's message was designed to remind you that your greatest pleasure, your greatest joy, your greatest satisfaction is found in enjoying these things within the framework of God's design. It may be that you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I never assume the salvation of anyone. And you're here and you came you're visiting, maybe you're a regular attender and you've never come to that point in your life where you've put your trust exclusively in Jesus Christ. The Bible says before God we're all sinners, we're deserving of hell and Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. And the way we receive eternal life and have the assurance of heaven is by trusting Jesus Christ. Not in a church, not in your good works, not in the ordinances, none, none of those things will save you. It's trusting Jesus Christ and Christ only. If you make that decision for Christ, we have a little book called How to Begin the Christian Life. It's our gift to you. My contact information is in there. If you would, please give me a call if you still have questions. Friend, the greatest joy, the greatest joy in my life is to sit down and share with people how they can know for sure they're on their way to heaven. So give me that privilege. Give me that joy. Give me that happiness. And I promise you, it will be the greatest decision you ever make. Father, thank you again for the study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Thank you for Solomon, who is courageous enough to, to write this book. And I pray that we would realize it's here for a purpose. It's not designed to depress us or to discourage us. It's designed to drive us back to God. Help us, Father, to take the advice that he gives in chapter 12 and to remember our creator in the days of our youth so that we don't make the foolish mistakes that he did. Grant to us now as we go out into the world a sense of your leading and direction. We continue want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Bless our dear brothers and sisters in Christ over there under attack. 
Pray, Father, for those who have yet to trust Christ. And I pray that you would draw them to yourself. We pray that we would realize that Israel is indeed the apple of your eye. And we need to pray for them even now. We ask these things in the precious and glorious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Go now well with me, I still will follow. Go none go with me, I still will follow. Go none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Have a great week.